Welcome back, everybody, to We Are TPM with myself, Kyle Teixeira. Sitting next to me is John Teixeira. As usual, this week, we are going to be discussing tips and strategies for maximizing short-term rental income. It's pretty simple, right? I mean, uh, but if you uh, if you have any, you know, you want any, you have any questions, you want more tips, more strategies, or want to discuss anything real estate related or otherwise, give us a call, 817-818-9039. Shoot us an email at showmethemoney at wertpm.com. Let's get into it. Yeah, Kyle, you know what? Uh, in the past, we've gotten into the numbers, we've gotten into how to do this and that, but but really getting into the nuts and bolts of how you, you know, and using our experience, our vast experience now over three markets that we're in, we've gained a lot of experience on how to do these things. And um, I'm excited to share it with everybody. Yeah, because it may sound like maybe we've gone over pieces of this, but we've been vague about a lot of it. Yep. And this is more of a, the drill mindset, down. drill down into the mindset you need to have to maximize your rental income. Because a lot of people get into short-term rentals and they're like, why isn't it working? And it could just be one thing, multiple things, things you didn't think about. Um, and a lot of that comes from experience. And we're just going to try to give out hard tips and strategies for, for things we do. Well, you know, you make a good point. I want to remind, before we get into them, I want to remind everybody, when I look at the an opportunity for a new short-term rental, we do almost exactly what real estate agents do, right? We run kind of like comps, right? They call them comp comparables, like a real estate agent would do. And, and, and so we're looking at the listings that are around that home so that we can see how the market is, if it's oversaturated, if there's more demand needed, um, you know, we can tell the vacancy times. We can tell, you know, there's a lot of information that we can see there. And when I do that, I'm always blown away by how how poor each of the listings are. Like how <laughs> how many of these things we're about to talk, talk about are not being done on any of these listings. Yeah, so it's like, there's a lot of this that is similar to real estate. It's, you know, sales, rentals, long-term rentals, um, as far as listings and marketing go. But then, like you were saying, you use comps, but you're also the, – the interesting thing about short-term rentals is you're not just looking at the present. You got to look at the past. You got to look at the future. Mm -hmm. Things you can generally ignore when you're just doing a 30-day sale. That's right. Um, you – you know, the future is probably the most important piece of that, yep. um, that analysis. So let's get into it. Let's, let's start with at the first tips and strategies can pretty much be used across any kind of real estate. And I'd say, but it's more important in short-term rentals is transparency in the marketing. So first professional photography, you, you know, best money you're ever going to spend on a short-term rental. I don't want to spend a couple hundred bucks. It's going to make you thousands more than you would make if you go shoot that on your phone. Thousands. And I know iPhones Literally are really good. And Tens of thousands sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it's going to, the, the front end of your short-term rental marketing makes the, the whole life of it. So Kyle, and I'll say I that all the time. I don't want to beat this point up, but I've seen people that are making thirty-eight thousand dollars for a home that we're doing eighty or ninety thousand dollars on in a year, right? Or that I think we can, right? And then the biggest difference is, is the first thing that you said. It's just the marketing, right? Well, we'll go on and look and see why aren't they making money and and. Before I even pull it up, it could be in the list with just the cover photo. And I'm like, oh, that's why. iPhone pictures. Yeah, I can tell. That's it. It's <laughs> like, I skip over it as a comp, just like the guests skip over yep. it as a listing. So, um, but then the, the dump, we jump into the transparency part. One of the differences is you have to place such an importance on not just painting a picture of the listing, but letting people feel like they know 100% of what they're booking. So, you know, where everything goes, what the rooms look like. Like, I know professional photography can sometimes make rooms look a little bigger. That's not what we're talking about, that you're not, uh, that nothing's being neglected. Like, if there's a grill on the patio that they can use, then that grill needs to be in the photos. Anything that they have that will be a part of the guest experience, um, as far as physical things, need to be in the photos. Because um, there's two sides to that. One they will be expecting it. But two, if you have it and you're not showing it off in the photos, then you're not even using that as a as a piece of marketing for the property, as a potential benefit to someone booking. And I think to your point, it's just as important to to point out what's not there or not available to the tenant, right? Mm -hmm. um, if for some reason you're refusing to have 
a hair dryer there, right? I don't know why you would do that, but if you did, then you you need to put that in your listing is probably just as important because people are expecting that. And when they book it and show up and there's no hair dryer, that causes way more problems mm-hmm. for you than the $19 hair dryer would. Yeah, and we're not saying to get Nick picky about all your pictures, but just descriptions and mm-hmm. in, in the experience. Like it and sometimes like we have uh, some luxury shampoo, conditioner and body wash in some of our listings. We actually will take photos of that and put that in the listing just so, you know, because there's there's a, diff, a whole bunch of different types of shoppers. Um, so, you, you know, some people only look at pictures. Some people mm-hmm. look at the first five and read <laughs> the description. So you want to hit those points everywhere you can yeah. is, is a big part of it. So, um, so transparency in the listing because, you know, I've even had a guest show up and say, say I was upset that you didn't have a bathtub in the listing and there's not much more of a response other than well we have five pictures of this bathroom yeah like i mean there's there's, that's not how i said it of course but you know why would they have been expecting a a tub and it's not listed in there and and we have a very open property and and to your point though and while you're preparing our next point which i think is just as important if not more important the the uh, people are either visual or they read, right? Mm-hmm. Very rarely do we find the person that does both of them. So we get oftentimes questions like with our pool homes, we get questions like, are they heated? Well, had you read, you would have seen that it's not heated, right? Or it is heated, but they just see a picture of the pool and they fire off that question. That's just a testament to how they're viewing the the listing really, mm-hmm. right? Which is why it, it's really important that you put that to your point, everywhere you can, and sometimes even in the picture, non-heated pool, heated pool, so forth. Yep. yep. And, you know, on short-term rentals, we have gone as far to put, like, added text in photos just to make things clear. Or, like, if there's a sh- if you know, Airbnbs and stuff commonly can be shared. If there's shared spaces, you can really paint a great picture of how they're shared by, you know, annotating photos. So. Yeah, and, the, and these things, the things we're talking about, they don't just save you money. Sometimes it's time. They save you time. Tons of time. Phone which, calls, questions. Yeah. Um, and, and another thing about, we'll get into booking platforms, but a lot of these booking platforms don't allow you a personal connection prior to booking. So they're just going to skip it. You know, if they ha- don't have clarity, they can't call you. Um, they can at best message you. Some people don't want to ask a whole bunch of questions. If there's too many questions for them to ask, they're just going to move on to one that there's not yeah. a lot of questions That's on. That's right. So. That's right. Um, before we get on to the next point, I think another thing that this ties into is expectations. You'd be amazed at how much it can help a guest experience, your reviews, and the long-term health of your listing just to send guests an expectations list as far as supplies. Like, this is what you, you should expect to get when you get here. So, if, you know, if you have problems with it beforehand, don't book it or, or whatever. But like, this is how much toilet paper and paper towels and shampoo and soaps and all that stuff that you're going to get. So and when do we send that, Kyle? We send that right after they book. Yep. So, that's right. I mean, whether you do that during, you know, sometimes time. too much information about what's going to happen when you get there prior to booking can, you know, you got to have a balance. Of where, the important information, the stuff that you know that might cause them to to cancel mm-hmm. or or not you know you want them to know that right up front because we don't, you don't want... want them locking up your calendar exactly so like say yep. they book three months from now you don't tell them till three days they cancel for that reason you could have saved yourself that booking because now you're way less likely to fill that yep. fill that space so, exactly and these all tie in to you know maximizing revenue because minimizing cancellations definitely mm-hmm. helps maximize revenue what's our next so, point uh pricing strategies so this is this can be seasonal pricing strategies, but in, as a whole, having pricing strategies that are dynamic and specific to your market, I think, is the most important, you know, one of the most important factors in maximizing your revenue of a short-term rental. So this could be split up into two ways. We could be talking to somebody like us that has several short-term rentals, right? That can that we have the means and and. The, the means, the know-how, and the ability to pay for a smart pricing tool, a lot like what Uber does, right? But then there's the person that maybe only has one 
or two of these, maybe it doesn't make sense to pay for that smart pricing tool. Well, then we'll uh, let me describe kind of what that, that means because it's you know, not everybody would know. But yeah. most hosts, like I've talked to a lot of hosts, even operators, and a common question is like, if especially if they're in the same market, is how much is your listing cost? How much are you charging? <laughs> And if you have a direct answer for that, that's part of the problem. Yeah. I am charging a different rate for every night of the 365 days that are in a year. Um, I don't have a nightly rate um, during, you know, a lot, of, a lot of hosts will make their rates once a month or every two months, look at the market and be like, okay, we're going 350 a night during the week and 450 a night during the weekend this month. And that's it. That's the price. Um, well, you're setting a pretty flat rate price for the guests. Um, without getting in too much to the specifics, there's you say smart pricing, dynamic pricing is a, what every other rental agency and technology that has existed for years, such as airlines, hotels, you, you mentioned Uber, um, all these pricing tools or pricing things are based on demand occupancy, you know, that last that last ticket on the plane is going to be more expensive than the first ticket on the plane. That's it's, That's right. it's no different in short-term rentals It's or hotels. If uh, there's a high demand and a low supply, prices increase. That's how you, that's a huge piece of maximizing um, so your what rental. If, what so, if you don't and, have that? What are you going to do? Well, if you don't have that, this is the easiest answer. I get that question a lot. If you don't have that, someone else does. And they're pricing around you. So you're at 350. They're pricing at 340. You know, if they say there's two rentals in the market, they're going to price it 349 for that night. And they're going to price the, the, the Wednesday that you weren't going to get booked before that whole booking at 120. And the guest is now going to stay Wednesday through Sunday instead of Thursday through um, Sunday, like they would have booked at yours. They're going to spend you know, more time there for the same amount they would have got your listing for. Um, that's just a very, you know, simple to understand example, but that's happening all the time at well, all different rates. And I think the point is whether you have a dynamic pricing tool or you don't, your point is to know your, know your market, know the demand. However you do that, you've got to somehow know the demand and adjust daily almost. I've got a friend. Yep. I've got a friend who who admits admitted to me he he manages his own Orange Beach condo and he admitted to me that he sits on the couch at the end of his day every day and opens up his thing and 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 adjusts his pricing every single day. Mm -hmm. You can do that, y'all, but I don't I don't know I don't look at my price. Do you look at the pricing that often? Definitely not every single day. It yeah. is adjusted every single day. It's adjusted automatically, but. I mean, and it's based on user input and what we decide, but I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, it's an algorithm doing doing a lot of it, like all of these companies do. This is the world so, of technology at this point. To to your point, let's use there's a there's a period there's a there's a weekend in March. March is kind of the beginning of our busy season in Orange Beach, right? It's the very beginning of it. It's not, the prices aren't summertime peak prices yet, but it's starting to, that's where it starts to kind of creep up. Well, there's a, there's an activity that is one of the biggest activities in Orange Beach at Florabama called the mullet toss and massive amounts of people come in. And if you don't know that and you just book, if you just price your March, right? Mm -hmm. Without affecting that, that weekend or Mayfest, right, where t thousands of people are coming in for Mayfest or in, in Gulf Shores. I mean, if you don't know that those things are, are happening and how how they contribute to the local economy, then you're going to miss the boat and miss an opportunity. Yeah, and that's where a lot of pricing tools uh, thrive is they don't necessarily know, you know, a computer doesn't know all the schedule of every every um but it knows that a lot of people it, are it knows looking. the data that a high demand and inflow for those dates right. and in a certain area is coming in and that affects pricing um you know it's very important in affecting pricing that way but it's also the flip side of that and what people don't think about is like okay i don't want to be driving up my prices when things are happening you know i don't want to be that guy or that expensive unit you, that's fine sealing your pricing but it's almost more important in the low demand times. So 
cost of ownership we've talked a lot about mm -hmm. and cost of occupancy and vacancy obviously is a minimum you're going to let somebody stay in your listing and and have a risk but to to not lower it when you're not going to get anything like you can, there's pricing strategies like pricing strategies we use maybe we will have a normal rate but it's three days from a weekend and we don't have a guest coming in and we never want an empty weekend. You can have empty weekdays, but I don't care what the listing is and what area it is. We don't want empty weekends. Mm -hmm. So those last three days, it gets aggressive. It starts, all right, we're going to get somebody lowering it, lowering it, lowering it. And it works. I mean, that's how you get people. And it's now you're getting a great listing at a cheaper price during a low demand time frame. And that's that's how it should be, you know. Yep. So if if a, if you're the only one staying in a hotel or in an entire hotel, it's probably going to be a cheaper room than if it's fully booked. So it's it's the same philosophy that we've had this conversation regarding vacancy rates for long term rentals, mm -hmm. and it's the same exact philosophy, except it's it just it's converted to a daily rate instead of a monthly rate, right? So different pace, a lot more factors that go into it. Um, and if it's, if we're talking about vacation rentals, it's you also need to know your seasons. Um, every most vacation rentals have seasons, like Orange mm -hmm. Beach. Obviously, people are going to the beach more often during the summer and spring when it's not as cold. That's just common thinking, and it's actually true. So the season we have season our hottest season at the beach in Florida is like May through August. That's summer. That's when kids are out of school. That's when families are traveling for vacations. Also um, in Alabama as well. Yeah. So if you're not <laughs> the Florida coast, right? Um, uh, to his point, Orange Beach is actually in Alabama. Um, <laughs> but knowing all those things and, and pricing around it is is not just a tip and strategy. It's, it's a must do. Um, even if you're doing it yourself, um, you just... You shouldn't be, especially it, the, the the amount of money these tools make you just blows the out the water how much they cost. I mean, so so and to your point, the worst thing you can do, worst case scenario, would be to set it and forget it, right? Oh, like yeah. if you're setting it and forgetting it, then you're probably not booking very much in the off season. You're probably getting way less than you should in the in the peak season. And you're doing yourself and all the other listings in that area a disservice. It's very true because you also have to look like anything else. You have to look at your market very often. You know, the short-term rental market in the country, in the area, all that stuff. If it's starting to get massively saturated, then maybe you need to know how to adjust your pricing and right. seasons. Yep. Um, really to anything that's going on. Yep. So. Love it. What's our next point? <clears throat> well, the number one thing that... This isn't the number one, but this is very common is, and we've talked about this in a lot of these industries, but I'm going to state it as casting, casting the proper net, but online booking platforms so commonly, I, I wouldn't even say it commonly, every market we've jumped into, almost every operator or host that we've talked to says, I don't do Yep, they're one on of one. They're on one platform. I do not do direct bookings. I do not do Airbnb. <laughs> I do not do VRBO. I do not do Booking. dot com. Um, I ran into a guy in Broken Bow that doesn't do any of those. He has. If you want to book one of his units, you have to do it on his direct booking site. And I feel like it's probably a site that was made in 1994, and he hasn't looked at it since. Well, and that's very common up in Broken Bow, but and that's direct to consumer. You know, like people do that with products. Okay, but you have you have these simple factors when it comes to online booking platforms. You got where where's your audience? Where are people booking at? Where are you? How much revenue do you expect to get from a booking? And how do you adjust accordingly for those things to where it makes sense? So if you only book directly because you want to get, you don't want to pay Airbnb, their big service fees, um, and you know, you want this much net for this a booking, well, then you, you know, tack up your pricing on Airbnb to adjust accordingly so that your net is exactly what you want. Because it goes back to vacancy. Well, because the guests are going to pay the Airbnb's massive service fees because yeah. on their side, right. there's guests that are comfortable having that backing of Airbnb who will take care of things if there's something wrong. They don't care about the higher price point. Okay, well, now, you by only booking directly, you're 
steering away that audience. Yeah. And then there's a different type of people who book on VRBO, or maybe there isn't. But the point is, there is people looking for a listing like yours on those sites. So why are you not on those sites? Yep. It's really that simple. It um, amazes me. If you have a good reason, there's certain markets where I will not go on booking.com. This is rare, but there are reasons, but they have nothing to do with pricing and revenue. So um, if you have those reasons, go right ahead. But It's the same conversation that we have with for sale by owners selling their home, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's exactly the same thing. I can go and do it myself. I can, I can go on Zillow and put it on, on, on their, you know, listing site. Like, okay, so now you have it on Zillow and that's it. That is your audience. That's a big audience, but it's not as big of an audience as it would be if somebody was casting that large net and it was on all the sites that everybody uses and not just the Zillow users. Well, and you can always make the argument, not not knocking direct bookings, we do direct bookings too. But if that's all you do, that putting that website up doesn't get you bookings. You know, you're doing some external marketing, you're paying somebody. You have you're, to you're, do that, yeah. Your, your cost of each guest, there how, is a cost to each guest. How are you driving traffic to that direct booking site? Yeah, compare it to the other ones, I mean, and adjust oh. accordingly. You can mark up websites. Like I could mark up Airbnb, mark down VRBO, mark up booking. If I don't like booking.com, let me mark it up a hundred percent. Oh crap. Somebody paid double for a reservation. Yep. What? Okay. Yep. That made it worth it. So, yep. um, you know, just be there, you know, so especially cause then people can reach out to you and maybe you give them deals or whatever it is. So it's, it's just cost in the net. So, cause then we, the biggest thing we've seen is also know the rankings in your market. We're in three different markets. Every single market has a stronger platform. Like here in DFW, Airbnb is the strongest. Everybody uses Airbnb to book. 90% of our guests here are Airbnb. In Broken Bow, it's pretty much split. It's mm -hmm. pretty split 50-50. Um, and that completely depends on your term of stay. You know, if I were to change my term of stay to five nights, it's VRBO. Um, and then in Orange Beach, it's VRBO. is It's like 80% of the stays. So, like, it really matters to know. Um, so, if you're, you know, in Orange Beach and you're not on VRBO, now you know you're missing 80% of your potential. So Yeah, and that, that has a lot to do with who's booking, mm -hmm. right? Like, what generation are they from, right? And, and how far in advance they're booking will kind of determine what, what booking site they land on, but... And, you know, your market will determine that here in DFW, people aren't planning ahead to come to these events like months in advance. They find out two months in advance and they're like, oh, I need something. Right. But when you plan a beach vacation, sometimes you plan that a year in advance. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes you're there on the beach going, we need to do this every year. Let's book something for next year and see if we can get, you know, and so and that we get that into, all the time. That comes into another <clears throat> pricing strategy of how far in advance do you allow bookings? <clears throat> there you go. In Orange Beach, we allow them like three years in advance because it's true. You do do that. There's areas you don't want to do that. So um, let's get into the next point. The next point would be amenities. So, it's a very general statement, but I'd like to call it what's unique. Why do I, what's unique in your listing? What, why am I, especially as things get saturated, why are we booking yours versus someone else's? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like, do you have a hot tub? Do you have a gym in your stay? Do you have an arcade game? Do you have a kid's thing? Or are you a blank slate listing that only has a couch and a TV in the living room, no decor, no kitchen supplies and a room, a bed in the room, which is know? okay, but that's going to affect your pricing. No, right? it's definitely going to gonna affect your pricing. It's going to affect your performance when things get saturated because it's it's about longevity in this game, especially in these days. What I just described worked three years ago. It's likely not going to work three years from now. You know, here's the other economic truth about everything we're talking about. Also, the more something costs the better quality guest you're going to get into your home. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you don't charge enough for your unit or have the right amenities so that you can charge more or whatever, all the things we're talking about, you get guests that can't afford as much. And, you know, the, the reality is when you have a bunch of those guests, you are more likely to have problems. 
right? Mm -hmm. The kinds of problems that cost you headache, time, money, and make you wonder why you're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And that goes back to pricing. (laughs) But but as far as the amenities, you, you know, these are short-term rentals. So you're having... You're giving a guest a short-term experience, you know. You want them to be something that'll make them... The things that matter are the things that make them happy in the short term, right? So, um, one thing we've done recently that works extremely well is smart homes. Um, Because, you know, in my generation, people my age may know a lot about smart homes, but there's some people who have not experienced it all, aren't going to spend the time and money to put it in their own house, but they see that on Airbnb listing and they're like, oh, that's cool. Maybe I can go get that experience. And this is as simple as putting smart switches in an Alexa in your house, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And the audience I just described is huge. I mean, it really is that because that's what makes that house unique. You know, I could have this, these two listings are the same, but this one gives me the, you know, the intrigue of, oh, I get to experience a smart home, um, luxury linens, you know, things like that, that people care about, um, an outdoor living space with a fire pit, a hot tub, you know, we, we highlight these unique pieces of our listings in the front marketing photos. It's like, it doesn't start with the living room. Living rooms are pretty hard to make look different. <laughs> there are living spaces, you know, um, unless that's where your, your thing is, you know, shuffleboard and stuff that like maybe wouldn't be in a house you live in long term but it's kind of cool to have we, for a know, couple days yeah we talked about this at, at more length um specifically about gatlinburg with with joel right and we've talked about this in the past about broken bow and orange beach because every market is different like in some markets there are certain things that are expected that you definitely would need to have Right. And if you're, if you don't have a, if you go to Broken Bow and you don't have a spa in your backyard that's covered and maintained in between guests, you are completely out of, out of the water. You're not, you're not even in the, in the running. Right. Yeah. I'd be surprised you make it a year. <clears throat> yeah. So that's like, that's like a standard. That's not what's unique. That's if you don't have that up there, it's like, I think, okay. I think Joel had mentioned that there's some things up in Gatlinburg that are like that. Some mm-hmm. unique, some unique things that people expect when they go to the Smoky Mountains here, we have to struggle in DFW and our different listings around town here. We struggle to make sure we go to great lengths to make sure that uh, since we don't have anything like that, that our listings are unique in some way. They're themed. Mm-hmm. They're um, th- something about them to make them memorable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And make them unique to the other things that are out there. So right. I mentioned a gym. A gym, even in the city, is mm-hmm. huge because then that gives you more of like what you get in a hotel. If it's, one of your rooms is a gym, if you have an office, so you have a business center, you have a gym, you, yeah, have, you know, absolutely. have what they would get if they also booked a hotel. It's one of the reasons, one of the mindsets for booking a short-term rental instead of getting a, a hotel at Hilton is that I don't want to, I want to be able to cook my meals, feel like I'm at home, come home, chill on the couch, just like I do when I'm at home while I'm here for seven days or 10 days or whatever. Part of that is, like you said, I want to be able to work out like I do every day. I want to be able to to log into my office like I do every day. Mm -hmm. You know, I still need to be able to do the things that I need to be able to do while I'm on this trip, vacation, whatever it is. High speed internet. High speed internet. Huge in this day. It's a must. Work at home economy. It's not a huge, it's a must. It's literally, you have to do a speed test now on Airbnb (laughs) and it is one of the front page items it shows. Then if you don't do that, then go do that because now they sort you that way. So um, people are like, well, I don't want to spend the extra 40 bucks a month for high speed internet. Well, you're losing far more than that. Um, and one of your guests will complain and low rate you for that simple fact. So, and to say you put all the amenities, like all smart, of your guests, all of will. your guests probably will, <laughs> especially if you put a whole bunch of smart TVs in the house and then have slow internet that can't run the smart TVs. It's like, okay, well, this was a fake amenity, which is a good uh, segue into our next point, which is very important. It's managing the guest experience from day one. And we, the same, it, you have to set a baseline from day one and at any rate, build on it, make it better. But your reviews and your reputation, because this is a business, is the number one thing that gives you longevity and maximizes your rental income. You know, you and I know how hard it is to get 
Super Host. What's the other one called for VRBO? Premier Host. Premier Host. These things are meant to be extremely hard to attain. And maintain. And maintain. And and for good reason, because they are they're those platforms are all uh, consumer based platforms, right? They're they're based on the consumer economy and ratings and and that's how you're held accountable because there's not somebody really telling you what to do. You're held accountable by your reviews. Yeah. And so it's so hard to attain it and and keep it. There's nothing more important than what you just described. There isn't. And there's nothing more vague and, and a big range than what guests expect and what the experience they want from you, right? So making them happy and getting those good reviews is the number one thing, especially on the front end. So I, I just, What is a super host and premier host? What does that do for somebody when they attain it? Um, well, for so many things, but for new, let's just say for for continuing your business, new listings get the the timeline to success is so shrunk. So like, say I'm a super host, let's just use Airbnb, for example, I don't have super host status, I'm pretty new, a brand new host profile, for example, you're probably going to take three to six months to see, to build enough traction to especially if you have a great listing five star reviews to build enough traction to be a vetted listing and show up really high on search pages, because then we get into SEO, right? Superhost kind of jumps you there. So now I'm a superhost. I get ranked high for being a superhost. I'm one of the top filters used for searching for listings. And when they, even if it's a brand new listing, it says this is a superhost with 500 other reviews on other listings or whatever it is. And you can, you show up way higher. So the, the, Speed timeline to success is like weeks versus months. So that's just one point as far as maximizing revenue. So this is um, kind of like this is kind of like an organic form of being one of those sponsored ads on a Google search. But it's organic, so people don't people don't ignore it like they do the sponsored ads. They actually are attracted to it. Yes. I mean like when you go search on Airbnb, you can click the filters button, but there's a super host filter outside the filters button. So like, it's like they want you to filter it almost because it's their vetted hosts um, and you can lose it. You know, they, they reconfirm us as super hosts every three months based on the last year. So you get reconfirmed every three months, reconsidered every three months, but it's based on a year's worth of reputation. So you can't mess up anywhere. Really, um, it's based on cancel. It's based on ruining or succeeding in the guest experience, but it's also exclusive in they give us perks and the guests that stay with us perks as far as timeline. And so, like something happens, I can pick up the phone and be on the phone with somebody with Airbnb within minutes. A normal host m- may take hours or be on yeah. hold, or you know, and you've been just, that normal host, so you know that. I've, yeah, I've been, so, <laughs> been on both sides of it. But so, so tell us then, how do we? get there and avoid that like like since clearly guest experience reviews their feedback are all extremely important and out of all the things we've talked about this might be the most important thing that affects your overall mm-hmm. your the overall amount of money that you make on this investment what do we what do we do you think about every step of the guest experience you think about the cleaning so don't the cleaning is is Step one, make sure your cleaning practices and procedures and who you have on your team is just solid. You know, that just needs to be solid. That's just a foundation because people are looking, you know, if you want to make everyone happy, that's hard. That's a hard thing to hit. But you have to try though, don't you? You have to try. But cleaning is the number one thing that if that's a complaint to anyone, it'll be a complaint to somebody. So you... You nail, you nail that, and then you start adding, what are the things that, you know, like I said, you can't make everyone happy, but if if you have things in your listing, like, you know, black makeup towels make girls really happy because they don't mess up all the linens, right, and makeup remover, and, and these things that may make them, say you get a, you I, I always talk to my clients about get a point, lose a point, right, like, so... Yeah. They may not like the quality of your dishes, but they liked the makeup remover. So you're still net even, right? So they're still giving you a five star review. They loved the uh, what you you gave them robes, so that made them really happy. And if you if you can give them more points of appreciation than you can give them of of 
you know, non appreciation, then you win. That's really what it is. And it's, well, that's a very analytical way to look at it. But do little things that make people happy more than you have little things that make, you know, the, the off people happy. Okay. They're and also, happy. on top of that, I'm sitting here thinking about something that happened last night to us, right? Mm -hmm. You did a great job of anticipating future needs, future problems, and you ordered extra remote controls for our TVs because we have the same TVs in all of our all of our units. And so we had a tenant that for some reason couldn't find the remote. We still don't know why, and we'll figure that out after they leave. But they called kind of upset, right, that there was no remote for this thing. And we were able to go to the office, get a remote, take it to the unit, and make them happy immediately. Yeah, and a lot of that comes from experience. You'd, you'd be surprised how much uh, TV remotes walk off. But, like, we use <laughs> – here, here's an insight into how we do. We, we use fire TVs. Um, I don't put fire TVs necessarily in my own home, but for the operations of – the Airbnbs, there's a lot of reasons I can give you on this, but like remotes walk off all the time. You can use any remote from any room in the house to control any of those TVs. So that's step one. Tell them that so they can get them happy until you get them a new one. Uh, there's, there's an app I can send you to control the TV with your phone. Um, there's instant solutions I can give you until I solve the problem. And that alone makes people, all right, well, that's, he solved my problem. He did all he could, really. He was, he was prepared right. for the problem. He executed on the problem, and then he solved it quickly. So within an hour, we had a new remote there from our office. Yep. Because I just got a freaking stack of them in <laughs> in, in our office. Because I I swear, one remote a month. I was impressed. I didn't even know out. you had all these all these remotes in our inventory. <laughs> this is great. We got it's a few of these things that happen commonly, and remotes yep. for some reason are one of them. Whether they bring a dog and their dog chews it up and they throw it in the trash because they don't want us to find out and <laughs> it may just be in a sheet, sheet cushion or something i don't yeah, know so, you never know um yep. the last one all right so we beat that one to death we can talk I can talk guest experience all day because it, it's specific to to your listing it really is so make sure that it's all at 100 and, and, and let's repeat it it's probably the most important thing it is definitely the most important because it's the most important because it can it's the most detrimental it can sink you and it can it can make you fly. It's the most detrimental. And everything else we talked about tied to it. Uh, Superhost standing takes a 4.8 rating on average. If you don't have a lot of reviews, getting pulled below that is very easy. So um, even if you do have a lot of reviews, <laughs> getting pulled below that is – and that's one of their requirements. So um, another one that I want to touch on is more boring. We'll go over it quickly, but it – is also important is legal and regulatory considerations and upkeep. That is knowing your laws, keeping up with your laws, and keeping up with the changes. Wake me up when you're done with this yeah. one, Tom. <laughs> it, because it's part of maximizing revenue. It changes so often. So if when you're starting it, you don't you pay attention to it. When you're running it, you don't pay attention to it. It can affect your revenue. Because when all these cities, if your cities don't charge taxes for them, they eventually will do one of two things they will ban them in residential areas or in your area or they will start taxing you for it and these taxes run from five to ten percent of your revenue and if you think five to ten percent doesn't affect your maximizing revenue it does um, the city of fort worth just put in a new ordinance two days ago so um, you got to know where it's going where it's at um, when you start and when you end. So, you know, these things are different all over the country, all different areas. So that is all I'm going to say. Pay well, attention to To your it. point, if you're not paying attention and you're not doing something you should be doing, it could cost you hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, right? Um, and if you break the rules, it could shut you down and yeah. cut you off in a day. Yeah, so, absolutely. And hopefully by that time you've hit your break even, right? Because, you know, all these front end things we've talked about, it's a front end business. You do most of the work. And money spent and all of that is done on the front end. It's a it's an in front end investment for a long term profit. So, well, that's a ton of information, Kyle. Is that it? Is there more? Well, we could go over every factor in, <laughs> in the world, but yeah, I'd I'd say the last one's guest feedback. Ask for it, respond to it, and execute on it. Um, it, that's the most important thing. Our first guests, we, we we our first handful of guests, we give them, we let them know they're our first guests, our first hand, whatever guests they are, we let them know that. We give them like thank you baskets to let them know 
you know, spruce them up a bit. Let them know that we appreciate them being our first guest. Because we want their feedback. And we're then not we make just it trying very to bribe clear. Them. We're not bribing you. We want you to go out of your way. Here's a treat for going out of your way to giving us any positive, negative feedback about your experience so that we can quickly adjust. And, and it goes a long way with guests because most of the time they're going to leave their negative feed because you like basically ask, beg to them for it. They're going to leave the, your negative feedback if they have any with you. Privately. And, privately, because you're making it very clear that you're going to quickly adjust it if there's anything. And they'll do. likely give you a five-star review because they appreciate the effort and the fact that yep. you're trying to make it better and, and that you're – people like being asked their opinion of yeah. things, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> and they like being first. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so the tell first your first guest. three guests that you're one of their first, your first guests, whatever. So. Yeah, most of these guests, he, he, they can't stop telling you what they like and love and and don't like about a listing when you ask them. You let them know that they're first. It makes them feel special, and and so, yeah, definitely that's a been a big uh, that's been a big thing for us to do. Love it. Well, I've been told our short term rental advice has been 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 helpful, and more specifics would be desired. So we we have <laughs> we tried go. to give you we, the specific we follow go. all these points, and you will very much be successful. I think the last one is hiring a super host and a great mm. operator that knows how to do all these things very well may not be the worst idea. So. No, you know what, <laughs> you know what, absolutely not. That's it's, I say that about everything, everybody, and everything when when it comes to rental management. Everybody should have a great property manager. That's not always easy to find, right? There's a lot of property managers out there that probably aren't, don't have as much, as much experience or, or aren't as on top of regulations or aren't doing the things. They don't have the systems in place, right? But when you can find one that has the systems in place, that has the expertise, whether it's a long-term rental or a short-term rental, they will make you more money. Y'all go back to episode, I believe it's two through five. We talked about how a great property manager makes you more money. Those, those, those episodes are timeless for us because the, the hold true, the hold true in 20 years from now. And it's like, it's like anything else, right? Like when you hire a great CPA, they should make you more money. They might cost you a thousand dollars, but they should save you way more than a thousand dollars, right? In taxes. Um, all this stuff sounds stressful. Yeah. Because it's, you there's be, a lot to it. You got to nail it all, right? You got to so. nail it all. Yep. And it's a business. So would you, uh, you know, I don't know. I guess you could set up a business and you can run it yourself. But if you've got somebody that can make you two or three times more and you don't have to do anything, wouldn't you do that? Quality of life. There you go. <laughs> it's easier to be hospitable when you have good quality of life, too. You know? <laughs> That's right. You might jump down one of your guests' neck one day on a bad day. And then, you know, what? how does that affect the guest experience? So, <laughs> so if you need help, y'all, Kyle's going to give you our number and an email address. But if you're in a different market, if you're in one of our markets, we're, we're, we manage currently Orange Beach, Alabama, Broken Bow, Oklahoma, and Dallas, Fort Worth area. So if you're in one of those markets, we'd love and be honored for you to reach out to us and ask us more about our services or what we do and so forth. If you're in a different market, still reach out to us. I bet you we have, we know somebody in that market that does exactly what we do as good as we do it. And, uh, and if we don't, well, we know how to find it. So reach out to us anyways. And that's how we got in three markets, right? That's right. You know, so it may be a market we can, we're considering as well. So, exactly. Um, but reach out to us. Give us a call, 817-818-9039. Shoot us an email at showmethemoney at wertpm.com. Thank you guys for tuning in. We are out. See you.